Turn with me to Revelation chapter 12 as we continue our study on heaven. It's a fight to keep heaven in our lives. It's a fight to keep heaven in our homes and in our churches and our land. But it's worth it. We're going to see what heaven is. We've been studying what heaven is, and I think you found out that heaven is not just a place where we go when we die. In fact, heaven is much, much, much more than that. And we're going to see today how heaven affects us. We've been studying about the throne of God. We've been studying about the great crystal of eternal life that's underneath the throne. We've studied about how heaven is a creation. Heaven is created. Heaven is just as large an invisible creation as the physical creation is. And as we study the phys physical creation, we're told that it's three billion light years across. Heaven, the invisible heaven, that we know about is just as large as that, but it is a creation. It's not always been here. God created it. God created the angels. God is eternal. And we're talking about time. But, but as God deals with us, we're going to see that eternal is much more than just time. Eternal is eternal life. And you can't have eternal without eternal life, that river of life that flows out from under the throne of God. And so as we go to chapter 12 today, we're going to study three things. Number one, we're going to read about, study what God says about the history of heaven. History has a heaven just like earth has a heaven. In fact, you're going to see that you can't separate the two. But we're going to study the history of heaven. We're going to study the war of heaven. Heaven's been in a great big war. Now, we think of heaven as this place of eternal peace, and of course it is when you get to go there. But heaven is much more than that. Heaven is in a war. And we're part of it. So we're going to study the history of heaven, the war of heaven. Then we're going to study the victory of heaven. So in chapter 12, starting in verse 1, Now a great sign appeared where? Would you underline it? A great sign appeared in heaven. The first thing I want to teach you about the history of heaven that God is teaching us, as we draw from the Scripture, is that you cannot separate heaven and earth. And although heaven is a place that we get to go when we die, if you've accepted Christ, you cannot separate heaven and earth. The history of heaven and the history of the earth are one and the same. Now, a great sign appeared in heaven. A woman clothed with the sun and with the moon under her feet and on her head a garland of 12 stars. Now, that immediately takes us back to the dream of Jacob. This is the dream, I'm sorry, of Joseph. This is the dream that God gave Joseph. And this is a picture of Israel. You go all the way back into the Old Testament, into Genesis, God gave Joseph this dream. Joseph is one of the sons, the 12 sons of Jacob. And this is going to be a picture of Israel. And we don't have time to go into this particular study of this verse, but this is Israel. This is a picture of Israel. Then being with child, she cried out in labor and pain to give birth. And another sign, another sign appeared where? In heaven. Behold, a great fiery red dragon having seven heads, ten horns, and seven diadems or crowns on his head. Now, I understand about Satan being in heaven, but what in the world is it talking about Israel being in heaven? That doesn't make any sense unless you know that heaven and earth are intertwined. And heaven's not someplace out there a long ways away. Heaven is the place where God is, that God has created, but he created it for us. And heaven and earth's history are completely and totally intertwined. And so when he talks about Israel, he sees a sign in heaven. When he's going to talk about the angels, when he's going to talk about... Satan, he's going to talk about heaven. And there you've got the spiritual and the physical intertwined. You've got heaven and you've got earth intertwined. You've got the history intertwined. And in verse 4, Satan's tail drew a third part of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth. 
and the dragon stood before the woman who was ready to give birth to devour her child as soon as it was born. Now, you're familiar with the Christmas story, are you not? That after Christ was born, there was a king that tried to kill Satan. I'm sorry, tried to kill Christ. Who was that king? It was Herod. But we find out in this story that there's somebody behind Herod, and it is Satan. And here we've got this dragon, Satan. The dragon stood before the woman who's ready to give birth to devour her child as soon as it was born. She bore a male child, that's Jesus, coming from Israel, who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. That's Psalms chapter 2 talking about Christ. And her child was caught up to God and his throne. Now, you've got God himself being born down here on earth. You've got God himself being born a baby on Christmas Day. Now, all of a sudden, we've got the history of heaven and the history of earth intertwined. And you cannot separate them. And they become one and the same. So as we study the history of heaven, the first thing I want you to see is that you're looking at the history of earth. And as you look at the history of earth, you're actually seeing the history of heaven. Now, this in verse 4, I'm sorry, in verse 3, you've got this great fiery red dragon. And we're going to see, of course, that that is Satan. And yet, this dragon has seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns on his head. And you're going to see these are the empires of the world that have tried to take over the world from Christ, tried to rule the world from the beginning of history until Christ comes back. These are the seven empires. You're going to have the empire of Babylon. Then you're going to have the empire of Egypt. Then you're going to have the empire of Assyria. And then you're going to have the Medo-Persian empire. And then you're going to have the Greek empire of Alexander the Great, who almost completely took over the world. And then you're going to have the Roman empire, which actually did take over all the known world. And then you're going to have another empire that hasn't come yet. It's going to be the rebuilt new Roman Empire that's coming. The seven empires of the world as they try to take over and rule the world. And now you've got Satan, that is the dragon, but he's shown and manifested with these seven empire heads. And you cannot separate the history of heaven from the history of earth. And the first thing he sees in verse 1, a great sign appeared in where? In heaven, and yet it's talking about Israel. And then in, in verse 3, another sign appeared in heaven. It's talking about Satan, and yet it's talking about the seven empires, and it's all mixed together. Now, the second part of the history of heaven is found in verse 4. Satan's tail drew a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth. He cast them to the earth. Now, Satan, someplace back in created history, Satan is a created angel, just like all the angels. In fact, I want you to take a look at this. Just mark this. Put your marker right here, and I want you to turn with me to Isaiah chapter 28. It's in the Old Testament to your left. I'm sorry, Isaiah 14. We're going to look at two prophecies that talk about Satan. We're going to look at Isaiah, and we're going to look at Ezekiel. Now here's a real easy way to remember this, where you can actually remember this. Isaiah chapter 14, starting in verse 12, and Ezekiel 28, just double it. 14, and the second one is Ezekiel, so times to it, it's 28. So Isaiah 14, Ezekiel 28. Both of them start in verse 12. It's pretty easy to remember. In Isaiah chapter 14, starting in verse 12, God is going to be comparing Satan with Babylon, and then in Ezekiel he's going to be comparing it with, with Tyre, but he's going to be talking about Satan. In verse 12, How you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer! Son of the morning, how you are cut down to the ground, you who weaken the nations. For you have said in your heart, and here come the five eyes, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. And when it says stars of God, it's talking about the angels. 
I will also sit on the mount of the congregation. On the further sides of the north, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like God. I will be like the Most High. And yet, you shall be brought down to Sheol, the lowest depths of the pit. Now, go with me to Ezekiel. Go right to Ezekiel. Chapter 28, Isaiah, Isaiah, Jeremiah. Ezekiel chapter 28, starting in verse 12. Remember, it's 14, 12, and 28, 12. Son of man, take up a lamentation for the king of Tyre. And it's going to compare Tyre with Satan. And say to him, thus says the Lord God, you were the seal of perfection full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering, the sardis, the topaz, the diamond, the barrel, the onyx, the jasper, sapphire, turquoise, the emerald with gold. The workmanship of your timbrels and your pipes was prepared for you on the day you were what? Underline it, you were created. There is no eternal struggle between good and evil. God is the only eternal thing. Satan was created. The angels were created. On the day that you were created, verse 14, you were the anointed cherub who covers. You were the anointed cherub who covers. I established you. You were on the holy mountain of God. You, you walked back and forth in the midst of the fiery stones. You were perfect in your ways from the day you were created until iniquity was found in you. In both passages, we're going to read verses 12 through 15. From the day you were created until, until you fell. Now go back with me to our passage in Revelation chapter 12, the history of heaven. There was a day when Satan got his eyes on himself and got him off Jesus. The only explanation for sin and the only explanation for iniquity in perfection is that you get your eyes off of God and get them on you. I will. I will. I will. I will. I will. Five times. Now in... Revelation chapter 12, the history of heaven. In verse 4, his tail. We're going to look at three things. He swept a third of the angels of heaven with him. Now look at this, his tail. Oh, wait, his tail. Go back to verse 3. What about his heads and his faces and his crowns? Verse 3. Another sign, wonder, miracle, something really unbelievably aghast appeared in heaven. Behold, a great and fiery red dragon having how many heads? How many horns? How many crowns on the head? And as Satan is projecting himself to the angelic population, they're all looking at his face. And what did he get them with? That is total, absolute deception. He is the deceiver. Did he not deceive Adam and Eve? Verse 9, The great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil, Satan, who what? Deceives the whole world. The reason for the tail. By the way, the word tail is only used three times in the New Testament. Right here. And when... The angels are demons. The angels are led out of the bottomless pit, and they sting with their tail. It looks like a scorpion, and they have a stinger on their tail. And I think this is exactly what Satan looks like, and he got him with his tail. The deception. But I want to show you something else. His tail drew a third part of the stars. But the word draw, right here, in the Greek, the root word for draw means to vote. 
They actually chose him. In heaven, Satan gets his eyes on himself and he decides that he can be God in heaven. And he presents himself to the angelic population. And this is the history of heaven. And a third of those angels voted to go with him. This, this root word actually means to choose. But the word means much more than that. When he drew them, this word draw, after you get past the root word, this word draw means to drag against your will. This means to draw a net of fishes and pull them, catch them, and pull them to shore against their will. This word means to force somebody to do something. So when he drew them, here's the picture. They voted him in as their leader, and all of a sudden, as they're looking at his face and voting for him, his tail and his stinger does what? It gets them while they're not looking. And against their will, he drags them, and it says he casts them to earth. Let's read this. This is not God throwing them to earth. We'll look at that in just a moment. This is Satan throwing them to earth. He threw a third part of the stars of heaven, and he cast them, he threw them to earth. This is an active verb, and Satan did it. Now, I want you to go down with me to verse 9. In just a moment, you're going to see that God throws them out of heaven, and he bans them from heaven. And in verse 9, the great dragon was cast out, and that's God. This is, this is passage. Somebody did something to him. God cast him out. And then, then he was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast with him and that's God doing it but not up here in verse 4 in verse 4 Satan cast them and the word cast also can mean to pour out and also can mean to insert and what Satan did is he just grabbed him an army and he attacked earth and he inserted them where they he wanted them in his army and they attacked earth against their will they never intended to leave heaven. They were going to take heaven over, but they never intended to leave heaven. I wouldn't want to leave heaven and come down here. Would you? This is against their will. The same thing happened to the German people in 1930s when they elected Hitler as the head of their country. And all of a sudden, they got drug into what they never expected what they did not want and it ended very poorly for them that's exactly what happens here he tricked Eve she chose she voted and he said you'll be like gods and when she chose she got immediately drawn into something that she never intended she was wanting to be like God and all of a sudden she dies she starts dying all of a sudden, her husband starts dying, as he chose. And then all of the garden starts dying as they start killing each other. And they never, ever intended for that to happen. Satan is such a horrible, horrible liar and deceiver. This is the history of heaven. Then Satan took them and he cast them to earth. God didn't cast them, not yet. Now, this is the history of heaven. Now, I want to look at, for just a minute, the war of heaven. Go with me to verse 7. We're going to look at the war of heaven and earth. We're going to get technical for just a moment, not too bad, so that you can understand the war of heaven. And, and war broke out in heaven. And Michael and his angels fought with the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought. Now, if you'll underline the word fought... Those two times fought. Those are past tense verbs. It's called aorist historical, historical aorist. They're past tense verbs. They're not talking about future. In a moment, we're going to see the future, but right at the moment, they're talking about past. Now, go back with me to verse 7, and war broke out. You see the word war? Would you underline the word war? There's two Greek words for war. One of them is strategio strategy and it is a picture of looking at the it's a picture of the war in total it's looking at the whole thing 
But then there's a second word, polemic. It's our English word, polemic. And it means to look at the war battle by battle by battle by battle. Now, you can study World War II, and you can determine what caused the war and who they were and how long it lasted. You can study it in toto, if you want, complete. Or you can study World War II. You can buy those great big thick books, and you can study it battle by battle by battle, and you take all those battles, and that makes the war. This is the word polemic, our English word polemic, and it means to take it battle by battle. This is going to be the history of heaven. When Satan fell war started in heaven battle by battle by battle if you want to study some of the battles go to Daniel chapter 9 Daniel chapter 11 and read about the battles that are taking place in the heavenlies as they're taking place down here on earth and what God is going to give you in verse 7 is he's going to give you the, the warfare of heaven battle by battle by battle and there was war there was polemic that broke out in heaven now when did that break out let me think oh yeah when satan took a third of it and where did it break out it broke out in heaven but where did satan throw his angels and you can't separate the war in heaven from the war on earth you cannot have a strictly secular history you cannot have a strictly secular society a strictly secular population there is no such thing and you can declare it secular and you're going to get blindsided by the spiritual because they are mixed together are you seeing this in verse 7 you got this war and he takes a third of them with him and there's this war that starts now it's going to end up in verse 9, it's going to tell you the last battle. Or one of the last battles in verse 9. So it starts at the beginning when Satan gets cast out and the angels, or Satan cast them out. And the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of, of old called the devil and Satan. So the dragon is one of his names. The devil is one of them. Satan, the accuser, is one of them. Who deceived the whole world. He was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him, and God cast them out. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now, now salvation and strength in the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brethren who accused him before God day and night has been cast out. In other words, at this point, he's banned. He's banned from heaven. He can no longer go to heaven. Now, until this time, he goes back and forth to heaven accusing you and me. Remember Job chapter 1? There came a day when all the sons of God came before God, and Satan came also. And God said to him, what are you doing? And he said, man, I've been walking all over your earth. I've been walking <laughs> all over your earth, to and fro, wherever I want to. God said, oh, wait a minute. Have you considered Job? Now, where has Satan been on earth? Where is he when he's talking to God? In heaven. And God says, now, would you like to consider Job my hero? You want to take my hero on? You want to take little David on? You want to take little Job on? And you've got heaven and earth mixed together. You've got the war mixed together. And so you've got this war of heaven. And now, the last, one of the last battles, he gets banned from heaven. And heaven starts singing. Now, lastly, what I want to do, I want to look at the victory of heaven overcoming Satan the victory of heaven in verse 11 and they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony and they did not love their lives to death the word overcame is the word Nike you would know it as Nike if we are going to work for God and live with God on heaven on earth, you better put your Nikes on. You recognize the symbol? The word Nike in Greek, all it means is victory. Victory! It says in verse 11, and they were victorious. 
But if you're going to be victorious, you got to put these on. You can't sit in your chair and be victorious. There's a great battle going on. Well, I can't wait to get to heaven and rest in peace. Well, that's true. But what are you doing right now to save the country? What are you doing right now to save your family? What are you doing right now to save the church of the living God in this country that is going under? What are we doing? And God says, I want you to have victory. Put your shoes on. Now watch this. He tells us how we're going to have victory. They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb. Let me tell you what that is. Have you ever heard of walking in the Spirit? Have you ever heard of faith? We're going to be fighting an invisible battle, and we're going to be fighting an invisible foe, and yet they are so real. Paul says we fight not against flesh and blood, although we do. We don't. We fight not against flesh and blood, but we fight against angels and principalities and powers in high places. And he said the weapons of our warfare are not physical, they are spiritual. But he said they are so powerful. When we fight in the blood of the Lamb, what we're doing is we're fighting in the power of God spiritually. Now Peter missed this. In the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus said, Guys, I need you to pray. I need you to pray hard. This thing's about to hit. And they went to sleep. And then when the enemy came, there was a physical enemy, but there was a spiritual enemy in the garden along with that army that came to arrest Jesus. This is a physical, spiritual fight. This is an earthly, heavenly fight. And Satan pulls a sword just like he should have done. And he tries to chop off Malchus's ear, but... This battle wasn't all physical. What's Jesus been doing for hours? What did he tell Peter to do for hours? And Peter decided that he, well, actually Peter went to sleep, and then he decided he would fight it in the physical. I think Peter was a powerful man. Peter was a brave man. Peter was courageous. Everybody else ran away, and Peter pulled a sword and stepped in between the army and Jesus. Now, he's, folks, he's brave. There's 600 Roman soldiers there. He stands in between Jesus and the 600 Roman soldiers, and the first guy that comes to get Jesus, he tries to cut his head off. He ducked and he got his ear. His name was Malchus. But he wasn't trying to cut his ear off. He's trying to cut his head off, and he's going to stand between Jesus and this army. But you can't hold. Satan is much, much more powerful than we are physically. We're going to have to fight this battle in the blood of the Lamb the resurrection of our God. We're going to have to fight it spiritually in resurrection power. God always uses courageousness, courage. Little David swinging his, swinging his little rock. But the reason little David was swinging his rock is because he believed in a big God. The army had run away. We're going to have to fight this on our knees. We're going to have to fight this with prayer and spiritual weapons. Now, the second thing he says, you're going to have to win this by the word of their testimony. The word is logos. The word, word is logos. It is the Bible. The Bible, the word of their testimony, and the testimony is the word martyrius or martyr. They are going to talk about the word of God until somebody kills them. They will not stop talking about the word of God. They will not stop talking about the truth. The word of God is the truth, and the truth is the truth. You cannot change the truth. The truth is eternal. And what is true never changes. And we're going to talk about the truth. God created a man and a woman to be married. Period. And that's the truth. You can't change the truth. We have a seven-day week. Now, why in the world... Wouldn't somebody have changed it to six or five? Why, why seven? And we've had seven since creation. Why? Because it's the truth. They fought it with the word of their testimony. In other words, the logos, the truth. And they just kept saying the truth until somebody killed them. 
And then the third thing, they did not love their lives to death. That doesn't mean they loved, they didn't love their lives until somebody killed them. That means this isn't just talking about tribulation saints. This is talking about the saints since creation. All the way to the tribulation. They got their eyes off themselves and onto Jesus. They did not love their lives. Would you underline the word there? The word lives is suke, soul. They did not love their soul. This isn't just talking about physical life. 1 John 2, 15 and 16. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. For all that's in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but it is of the world. You know what your soul is? It's your mind, your will, and your emotions. And they did not love the world, and they did not love themselves. They got their eyes off themselves. That's what it says. They did not love their lives themselves. What caused Satan to fall? He just kept looking at himself. It is not all about us. We've got to get our eyes back on Christ. We've got to get our eyes off of us. And back on Christ, we've got to get our eyes off of us, off the world, and back on Christ. The way we do that is we spend time in the truth. The word, the logos of their testimonies, we just get in the word of God and we spend it with our God. Heaven is not some place we go, although that is true. Heaven, when we pray, comes down around us and diffuses into everything we do. And when we start spending time with God, it diffuses into my heart. When I start spending time with God, it diffuses into my family. When I start, start spending time with God, if enough of us spend time with God, it diffuses into the church. If I start spending time with God, it starts diffusing into the nation. If my people who are called by my name would what? We've got to learn to pray. I didn't say we've got to learn how to pray. You mostly know how to pray. It's not about really how you pray. It's about praying. When your child comes to you and, and he's toddling around, or she is, and they say, Daddy, drink. Did they use good English? Did you give them a drink anyhow? Because you love them and you, they belong to you, right? That's how praying is. It's not how you pray. It's if you pray. If my people, my children, who are called by my last name, Christians, would pray. It didn't say learn how to pray. It just said talk to me. And I'll talk to them. And praying is much more than just talking. Praying is God talking to us and us talking to Him through the Word of God. Folks, this is the truth. We just keep saying the truth even though they kill us, we keep saying the truth because the truth is worth dying for. Now let me read you the truth. Moses gave this to me this morning. It's George Washington. It's him. It says, It is the duty of all nations, of all nations, to acknowledge the providence of Almighty God, to obey His will, to be grateful for his benefits and humbly to implore his protection and favors. George Washington, quote, unquote. He believed it. He's the founding father of our nation. The truth is the truth is the truth is the truth. And you can say there's no God, but when you're out on the battlefield and people are dying beside you, you know that it's only God who takes them and only God who leaves them. It has nothing to do with you. And every military man that's ever been through a war will tell you that. It's just God. And there is a physical, spiritual battle going on. Heaven is a wonderful place. We need it down here. And it's worth fighting for. Heaven is a wonderful place filled with glory and grace. I want to see my Savior's face cause heaven is a wonderful place. I want to go there! And it's here. Bow with me, please.
Father, thank you for the Word of God. Thank you for teaching us about heaven. Thank you for teaching us about this great war. And, oh, God, would you help us to get involved? Would you teach us to pray? Lord, would you teach us to seek your face? Thank you. In Christ's name, amen.